We are going through the book of First John, and we were in First John chapter 4 as we continue this series on Sunday nights looking at the great message that's found in this great epistle. Uh, we're looking at First John chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 tonight as the Apostle John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes and gives a warning. John had to deal with some false religion that was growing at the end of the first century, which is probably about the time that the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were written. It was called the Gnostic religion, and they believed some things that were contrary to what the Bible taught, but yet they claimed to be right with God. They would say that they were Christians. And John is writing to warn Christians about them. He's already discussed them in previous chapters. The Gnostics believe that the high God is so high and holy, he could not have anything to do with anything material. So that there was a lesser God, a God that's kind of just between the great high God and the creation, a lesser being that actually created everything. And that if Jesus Christ was indeed God, they taught, He couldn't have a physical body. He couldn't have come in the flesh because in their theology, everything material was evil. And if Jesus had a material body, then He would have been tainted with sin simply because of that material body. Well, we know all that is contrary to what the Bible actually says. And John is fighting that false doctrine that's growing at the end of the first century. And he says there in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they be of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. He uses a very affectionate term here. He says, beloved. He's saying, you're ones that I love. He spoke a great deal about love in his writings. And he spoke about the necessity of having the proper type of love toward one another and toward God. He says, do not believe every spirit. The spirit there is in reference to those who would be teaching. He's saying, in essence, don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. Just because someone claims to be a teacher or claims to have a message from God, just because someone claims to be a Christian, does not mean that they are automatically teaching the truth. Don't be gullible is what he's saying. But you test the spirits. That means every person that preaches, teaches, is to be put to the test using the standard of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says, Test all things, hold fast to what is true. We're to put everything to the test. Every book we read, every article or website we go to, every teacher we hear preaching on television, on the radio, on the internet, from a pulpit or in a classroom, they are to be tested. Don't be naive. Don't be gullible. Do not believe every spirit, but put them to the test, whether they are of God. See, we can know the truth. John 8 and verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We can know who is of the truth. We can know those who are teaching the truth. Because truth is knowable, truth is attainable, and truth is understandable. Because, he says, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now this is the end of the first century. And he's saying, even at that time, many, many false prophets have gone out into the world. False prophets would be those who claim to have a message from God, claim to have something laid upon their heart, claim that God has given them a dream or a vision or an intuition, claim that God has given them some special insight into the Scripture. They are teaching things contrary to the will of God, or they're putting their spin on those verses, as we will see a little bit later on. 
many of these false prophets are going out into the world. Now, to zero it in on what John's talking about, he says in verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. You know those who are speaking from the Holy Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, of course, that's not the only criteria because we have the rest of the 26 books of the New Testament to give us other indicators as well. But concerning what John was dealing with towards the end of the first century, and remember, they didn't have 38,000 denominations at the end of the first century like we do today. They had Christians and Gnostics. That's basically it. And so the Christians were the ones that were teaching the truth, and the Gnostics who were claiming to be Christian were teaching error that was very much knowable. You could see and you can detect very clearly who was teaching the Christian message, the gospel, and who was teaching the Gnostic message. By this you know who has the Holy Spirit of God. Every person that confesses that Jesus Christ Jesus the Messiah has come in the flesh is of God. The Gnostics weren't saying that. The Gnostics weren't teaching that doctrine. They were saying that he appeared as a phantom, as an apparition. He did not actually have a physical body. That's why John emphasizes Jesus came in the flesh. The word that was with God, the word that was God, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, that word became flesh... And dwelt among us. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 14. He became human and dwelt among us. So that emphasis on Christ becoming the flesh is battling that false doctrine of Gnosticism. Which says Jesus didn't come in the flesh if he was God. So they were denying the humanity of Christ. But they held on to his deity. Today it's usually backwards. Usually it's the opposite of that. You'll have people today that will acknowledge the humanity of Christ, but deny his deity. Say that he was not God. Or say that he was just a good man, or just a great prophet. But they will deny that he was God in the flesh. Any doctrine that denies the nature of Christ, whether it be his humanity or his deity, is not of God. Look at verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. That's a simple way to distinguish between the Christians and the Gnostics of the first century. The Christians were teaching the gospel message that Jesus is come in the flesh. The Gnostics were saying, no, he didn't have a human body. They were not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. We've talked about this earlier as we looked at this word Uh, earlier in the book and it simply means they are against christ to be antichrist means to be against him this is the spirit of the antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world so the antichrist is not someone that's going to come at the end of time here is the antichrist at the beginning of christianity teaching and denying the deity or excuse me the humanity of christ and If people today deny the humanity of Christ, they are antichrist. And if they deny the deity of Christ, they are antichrist. They're against him. That's what that simply means. So we have this warning here from John for us not to be naive. Not to be gullible. That there are going to be false teachers, male and female, who are going to teach things contrary to the will of God. And usually it's the popular ones. Usually it's the ones that are the best sellers. Usually it's the ones that people will flock to. That people will listen to. You know the warning about false prophets. Let's go to the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, it starts with Jesus. Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In chapter 7, towards the end of that masterpiece of a sermon, said you need to watch out for false prophets. They're going to lead you to that broad way that leads to destruction. 
In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. In other words, they're disguised as Christians, but they're not. No false teacher is going to have a t-shirt on that says, I am a false teacher. They're not going to have a name tag that has their name and say, underneath it, I'm a false teacher. They're going to appear to be one of the sheep. But they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. See, you can know the truth. And you can know the produce of these false teachers. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You see, we're fruit inspectors. As Christians, we judge righteously. John 7 and verse 24, Jesus said, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. When we are judging anyone who teaches or preaches, we're fruit inspectors. We're judging what they say. Now, before we look at these other verses, there's different types of false teachers. The first type have always taught false doctrine from the beginning that they've always been in the teaching process, they have taught error. Then there are those who once taught the truth, yet now they teach false doctrine for whatever reason. They teach error. Then you have the problem of people who will compromise with them, continue to fellowship with them, Continue to embrace them. Continue to be friends with them. And we're going to see that's a problem too within the brotherhood. So you have those who have always taught error from the very beginning of their ministry. They've never taught the truth. Then you have those who at one time taught the truth and forcefully, but now they teach error. Then you have those who aid and abed error. And that's wrong. We're going to see that from the scriptures tonight. So Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that we are to beware of these false prophets. They're going to be there. They're going to be dangerous. They're going to try to blend in with everyone else. And let me tell you, when you start exposing them, they will show their teeth. I've had it happen so many times. They're ferocious. They are ungodly in their character. They are very vicious in lashing out against you when you expose them for who they are. How did the early church deal with false doctrine when it arose? Look at Acts chapter 15. Did they have that ecumenical live and let live attitude? Did they have the attitude, well, people have different opinions and different concepts and we just need to, for the sake of unity, get along, have unity in diversity? No. No. Look at Acts chapter 15, when false teachers started entering into the church. Acts chapter 15, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version because there's a word there I want to bear out. Here's how they dealt with it. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. English Standard Version. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. They're adding something to the plan of salvation. Verse 2. After Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Verse 7 also says there was much debate. Now, this is a fine art that many in our brotherhood don't want to do anymore. Don't want to do it. They don't want to debate. They don't want to confront false doctrine and expose it for what it is. 
But that's what the church of the Lord did in Acts chapter 15. And by the way, that's what Jesus did. You read Luke chapter 20. Jesus engaged in debate with the religious leaders of his day. We have developed such an attitude of live and let live. Let's all get along. Let's all have unity. And let's just ignore these various doctrines for the sake of unity. Brethren, there is some unity that's wrong. There is some unity that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. We need to stick with biblical unity, just like we need to stick with biblical love. What the Bible says about love. So Paul Paul and Barnabas engaged in much debate over that issue. They went and they appealed to God's will on it. And they said, here is God's will on the matter. And you read further in Acts chapter 15, they send out a letter and say, this is how it's going to be. This is God's will on the matter. So those who taught contrary to that were wrong. They were contrary to the will of God. Paul again warns, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 31. He warns the eldership at Ephesus concerning the problem of false doctrine. Paul says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. These false teachers who are sheep are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to come in among the church. He even said, "Come Come in among you. They're the church at Ephesus. He says in verse 30, Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, verse 31, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every every one night and day with tears. Do you see Paul's compassion? Paul was not a warmonger in the sense of he just loved to argue and quarrel. He hated it, but it needed to be done. He warned them about what was going to happen. They're going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. He says, even among yourselves, even among the eldership, there were going to be those who taught error. Why? They're going to speak perverse things. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, that unknowledgeable, ignorant, and unstable men twist the scriptures to their own destruction. That means to distort it. They're going to twist and pervert the scriptures with their own interpretation, their own understanding. Why? So they can have a following. That's why. So they can have people follow them. They draw away disciples after themselves. They want to be known as the balanced church they want to be known as the loving compassionate church you know sometimes when people talk about balance it means they're riding the fence they're riding and teetering on the fence they won't take a stand for anything that's not biblical balance that's compromise we're warned again 2 Corinthians chapter 11 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks to the Lord's church at Corinth and and he's concerned about them. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 3, But I fear lest someone, or somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Look at verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He's saying, I'm afraid for you because you'll put up with it. Someone preaching another Jesus, a different spirit, or a different gospel. You might put up with it. And we have brethren today that will. They will put up with it. And it's usually the huge churches in which people can get lost in the crowd. And see, it's usually the places where the elderships are very permissive. Things can get, get, a, get by with there. 
and all kind of different interpretations and understandings are allowed to go on, you may well put up with it. He's saying, I'm, I'm scared that you're going to do that. I'm afraid for you, brethren, at Corinth, that you'll put up with it. Same chapter, verse 13 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. You know, Paul writes to the Galatian churches of Christ in Galatians chapter 1, and he is surprised. He marvels at them. That word means to be astonished. It's just astonishing to them that they would turn away from the gospel to another gospel. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. I can't believe it, Paul is saying. Which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That means cut off from God. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what we have received, let him be accursed. And Paul included himself in that and said, if I start preaching a different gospel, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to be lost. That's how serious this is. Peter warns us. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. The whole chapter is dealing with the problem of false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Notice what Peter says. There were also false prophets among the people. You can go back in the Old Testament. You can see those false prophets. Some of them are the prophets of Baal. Some of them were like Hananiah in the book of Jeremiah. That was the popular false prophet that taught the people what they wanted to hear. Whereas Jeremiah told them what they needed to hear and he was hated. There were false prophets among the people, verse 1. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And here's the sad thing, verse 2. Many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Many people are going to listen to them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, there's only going to be a few that won't. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Many will follow their destructive ways. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 15? They're blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit or the ditch. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. They're going to blaspheme the truth. They're going to speak evil of it. They're going to call it legalism. They're even going to label it false doctrine. The truth they will label false doctrine. Verse 3. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. In other words, God's going to handle them. They're going to be lost. But you be warned, they're going to be there. They're going to be there and they're going to be dangerous. Jude warns us. Jude, verse 3 and 4. In fact, a lot of what Jude says you can find in 2 Peter chapter 2. Jude, verse 3 and 4. Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you 
exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He wanted to write about their common salvation, but he was under the power of the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted him to write. He found it necessary to exhort them to contend earnestly. That means to fight for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. Lasciviousness, some translations say. And deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are false teachers out there that are saying, it's okay if you divorce and remarry, contrary to Matthew 19, 9. It's okay for you to do that. Just get baptized and that marriage will be okay. That's very popular in our area. Very popular. It's okay if you did that before you were converted. Just whatever marriage you're on now, it's the third or fourth one. It doesn't matter why you divorced and remarried. Just get baptized and you'll be okay. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Prom season is upon us. How many elderships and how many preachers won't touch the concept of dancing this time of year? Because they don't want to offend the young people. They don't want to offend those who put big money in the plates. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Allowing that to go on. Allowing that corruption to go on within the congregation. And on and on we could go to talk about how they turn the grace of God into grease. And think that people can just slip into heaven, sins and all. God's grace is not that way. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Titus chapter 2 tells us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So we have to look at what the Bible says concerning the grace of God and understand the difference between the false grace that's being proclaimed and tolerated and the true grace of God that's found in the Bible. 2 John, verses 9 through 11. Let's see what John says concerning this. You see, brethren, we have a responsibility towards those who teach error. We have a responsibility towards those who teach error. We don't want to find ourselves encouraging that. If we attend a congregation where error is being taught and we keep put money in the plate, we keep putting money in the plate, we keep supporting it, we keep attending it, we keep fellowshipping it, we are in sin with them. I don't know how else to say it. That's a sinful thing to do to keep supporting and enabling false doctrine. Look at what John says, 2 John verses 9 through 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If someone does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, they don't have God. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. You see, we can find ourselves sharing in the evil deeds of these false teachers if we keep supporting it. And some people rationalize, well, I'm going to stay and I'm going to try to make changes. Well, that could be good. But you'll find yourself over time if major changes don't happen, you're supporting it. You're supporting the false doctrine. We cannot be one in Christ and have true unity if we speak different things. The reason why I know that is because of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul urges us to speak the same things to be of the same mind and same judgment. I cannot have unity with someone who says that hell is not eternal punishment. I can't have unity with that person. Because he's teaching contrary to the will of God. Nor can I support that person. 
I cannot have unity with a person who teaches contrary to Matthew 19 9 on divorce and remarriage. Cannot have unity with that person, nor can I support that person. You know, the Bible is very clear. Once again, what are we supposed to do when we find that happening? What is our responsibility, those of us who want to hold to the truth and are not looking to deviate God's word and try to find a following? What is our responsibility? We are to engage in righteous division. Is there righteous division? Look at Romans chapter 16, 17 and 18. The Bible teaches there's righteous division. Romans 16, 17, and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. We're to avoid false teachers, not continue to support them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by their smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, Jesus talked about division in a righteous way. It's going to happen. It's sad when it happens, but sometimes it's a necessary thing. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Sometimes division to obey God is necessary. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. And sometimes his own congregation. We need to beware. We need to beware and we need to put everyone to the test. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, back to the scripture that is our text for tonight. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe everyone who's preaching. Test them, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We can know who's false because we know what's true. We can know the truth. And when we know it, we can immediately identify that which is error. Are you of the truth? Have you obeyed the truth of the gospel? Believe in Jesus Christ. Confess that he is God's son. Repent and be baptized. Immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you'll be added to the church. Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 and verse 47. If you've done that and you've gone astray, we urge you to repent and God in His mercy and grace will forgive you. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and we sing.